idea and and when you if y'all want to talk about key characters right okay uh good afternoon glad you could join us we're capturing the stories of Pflugerville. it's the 50th anniversary of the city uh -huh. and so uh, tell me your name and where you were born i'm mike marsh i was born in houston texas and raised in humble texas just north of houston and I'm Britta Herzog. I was raised, I was born in Harlingen, Texas, and uh, moved from there to Denver, Colorado, from there to back to Harlingen. I was an Air Force brat, so I moved around a Can lot. Please spell your name? Britta, B R I T T A. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, and uh, so, what is your role or past role or present role in the city or community? When we moved to Pflugerville in 1983, we became involved in, as a volunteer in the city. Um, one of my first roles was on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I was, and I became vice chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission after a couple of years. And that's when Scott Winton was the chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and he was the one who had the idea of the hike and bike trail. And we all thought it was a pretty grand idea to try to implement but we, he started it in small pieces, and now we've got well over 20 miles worth of hike and bike trails here in town. And so that was in 1984. And the hike and bike trail today is probably one of the key features of the city when people look at where they might want to locate and for the citizens. It is, it's actually a, a model plan for a lot of communities that want to incorporate a hike and bike trail in their master plans. We've had a lot of visitors from out of town, and not only Texas, but around the United States who've come here to look at the hike and bike trail. So while you were on the Planning and Zoning Commission, did you uh, expand the trails? Did y'all have to go out and acquire more land? I know the Flicker uh, Park on Gillian Creek was the first dedicated land, but now it goes all the way out to the Metro Park. I think, the, if I remember correctly, the first section of the hike and bike trail was when they developed Willow Creek and the city implemented some requirements that they contribute to the hike and bike trail, either financially or actually build part of the trail. And then as further development came along, they added their sections of the hike and bike trail. They might not have connected at that time. And then the city came in later and filled in the places that connected the trails. And, th and they're still connecting sections of it today. So it's, it, hasn't, it wasn't built all at one time, it grew as the city grew into what the hike and bike trail is now the system. And uh, Britta, what is your role in the community? Well, I've been a member of the downtown planning, downtown, um, what do you want to call it? Association. Downtown Association for many years. Um, have been um, the treasurer, secretary, you know, et cetera. Um, and very involved in different, different things that happen down here to bring people into downtown Pflugerville and have them um, enjoy what we have down and see what, what goes on down here. So, One um, landmark now in the city is the Fallen Warrior Memorial. I would like to know how that idea uh, started. We lost uh, Sergeant Byron Norwood in Fallujah during the campaign to take the Fallujah back from the, the terrorists or insurgents or whatever they were called back then. And out of a sense of community, I attended his funeral, which was held at the Pflugerville High School Auditorium Performing Arts Center. Sat on the back row and found one of my friends here in town, Clifford Damstrom. And so we sat together during the funeral. And after the funeral, I asked Clifford, I said, have we ever lost any other people defending freedom from Pflugerville? And he said, yes, we have. I can't tell you who they were, but um, I said, you know, we should do something as a community to honor these people. So Clifford knew a lot of the older generation in Pflugerville, so he said, let me go ask around and see if I can find out. And I said, okay. So we, we parted from the funeral, and on the way back, I passed by Britta's art shop, I said, I'm gonna stop in and talk to Britta about it, see if she could come up with some kind of design. And in my head, I had this little simple design, you know, <clears throat> maybe a field cross or something like this. 
So I told Britta about my conversation with Clifford and said, do you think you could sketch up some ideas for this, just in the event that it grew legs and, and it carried forward? And she said, yep, I'll be happy to do it. Um, she was she was pretty emotional. She started tuning up on me just <laughs> thinking about it. And uh, but so we parted company and just it, it was a very innocent beginning. And then Clifford started talking to some of the people, um, especially at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. And one by one, the word spread, and people started bringing their stories about it. Mm -hmm. And I remember Winnie Mae Murkison saying, "There's a there's a boy I went to school with in my class. I think that was killed in World War II." And these were the kind of, she couldn't remember his whole name, so she, she started thinking about it and talking to other friends of hers. And it was truly a, a, a successful grassroots program that developed. One person would contribute a name or, or a, a clue and Clifford would go track it down. And so he was kind of the research person for it. Mm -hmm. And. Um, Unbeknownst to me, Britta embraced the idea and started doing a lot of research. And um, we agreed that was the funeral was in November, and in January we got together. And we had um, Janice Heath on the, and Ron Byer and Mark Kathy. Evans Kathy and Ellis. Kathy Ellis and Britta and I. Well, I forget who else was. That was probably it. Was probably Just a small group to get together and discuss what would be possible to do. And this thing just took off. Everybody was excited about it and thought it was the right thing to do. Um, so we started meeting on a regular basis. And I guess after a couple of months, you presented, after a couple of meetings, well, you presented a design to us and we were all flabbergasted by it. No, the fir well, the first, the first one, um, I did do the cross, you know, with the boots and the and the helmet and the dog tags and the gun, and um, I think it was Kathy Ellis that came up and said, "Oh no 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 no, that's not that's not big enough. That's not grand enough. We need something bigger, something better." So we started thinking about terms of how many how many soldiers we could include in it how grand we wanted it. And um, because now the, the service is, uh, is women as well, we decided to keep it to generations, the three generations, the World War I, World War II, and the current day. Uh, so that's how we got the three soldiers. And then of course, then, then Clifford and Mike were working on the, the monument in back of them, uh, which listed the names. And the and the dates and that sort of thing and so it just kind of went from there and and then we got and then we got um, Belinda Byers and and Jill involved in the money raising part of it and they just t took off and and flew with it it's like it was like wow <laughs> it was pretty interesting we were told that we would <clears throat> probably be more successful with some corporate donors to help fund it so. We approached some national corporations who were just moving to Pflugerville and asked if they'd like to contribute towards it. And we were pretty much rebuked by these national corporations. They said, not only will you not be able to raise enough money to fund this, to build it, but um, your ideas are too grand, your ideas are um, too expensive, and we, we won't contribute. And that just kind of set wrong with a lot of us. So we started putting the word out. And one of the things I'm really proud about this community is that we raised $100,000 in cash from individuals, no corporations, um, in seven months. We had the money before we finished that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was just incredible, the response we had. Yeah, we had a little bit of money left over. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was just incredible, the response we got from the community. And we didn't have to sell anybody on the idea. We just mentioned it, and they reached in their pocket, and the checks just started coming in. And we knew that we could do what we wanted to at that point. And we had some of the donations to build it in kind, like um, KRM Concrete donated the, the concrete base for it. Um, we had a lot of volunteer labor. 
And Britta worked with the city for the site selection, and that's how it ended up in Gillingham Park. She handled all the creative processes of the memorial. Tell us, Britta, about determining the site. Did you, did you walk the trail? How, we how did. How did you come to that particular location? Well, we wanted it to be accessible to the public, and we wanted it to be where uh, anybody and everybody could, you know, come up to it, walk up to it, walk around it, uh, take their hand if they wanted to. Um, and when we crossed the creek, and there was that, that space, open space right there, pretty much that was it. We knew that that, that was going to be the place. Okay, so you designed the, the, the memorial, and yes. then you had someone to actually uh, build it. Create it. And, and who did that, and what is it made out of? Her name is Cindy Burleson, and uh, she and I went to high school together, <laughs> and we're in homeroom together, and uh, it is made out of bronze, and it was, it was bronzed in a foundry in Fort Worth, and brought back down here, and set, they set it up. Tell me a little bit about yourself, where you went to high school, and how you became an artist, your, your pathway to becoming a successful artist. Well, I got in trouble in the second grade drawing horses, but um, uh, back in when. But uh, I actually graduated from McCallum High School, and Cindy and I both graduated from there. And um, I got married. She went on to uh, UT and became a fine arts major. And um, I just started, you know, kept drawing and, oh, you know, would sit around on Saturday afternoon and watch Bob Ross, you know. <laughs> I, Ross. I shouldn't, I shouldn't tell that. <coughs> but, uh, you know, that, but it stimulated me to start wanting to do more for myself. And so then I started taking other classes in art and started other pursuits uh, to to pursue my, my interest and um, and took some classes from a portrait artist uh, for about six years named Charlene Epright and um, she's very prominent in Austin as, as far as portrait artists go and so had a nice background for portraits. Well, you have a very special talent and I recall also that uh, there was a massive storm that came through Pflugerville probably more than a decade ago, and it uh, actually uh, damaged the Emanuel Lutheran Church windows near the altar, and uh, it actually uh, impacted the altar um, painting of Jesus in Gethsemane. And you were the go-to person when we saw the damage and wondered whether it could be fixed, and you were able to do it. Actually, the storm didn't didn't do that much damage to the painting. The painting, being the age it was, had started. The paint had started flaking off, hmm. and uh, had flaked off around the edges. So I was able to uh, match the colors and paint over the pa places that um, that were missing paint, and um, made it like it is today. Add restoration back, to her resume. Now. Back yeah. to new. <laughs> Brought it back to life. <clears throat> Brought it back to life. Uh, so let's go back to the fallen wire uh, and the actual dedication. And Mike, you want to talk about that day and the person who spoke and as he, his first sight of the memorial. We, um, I believe the man's name is, it was Major Sergeant Jim Nyer, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And I'd never met him, but Bill Norwood knew him. And Jim had retired from the military and was now active in Veterans Affairs. And he traveled all over the United States uh, at different military installations and, and helped implement and, and execute some of the programs that, for the VAs, for their benefits. And um, being a local Fleurville resident, and this was a local project, we thought it was appropriate that he give the keynote address. And the day before the dedication, he and I were walking down the sidewalk towards the memorial, and we're discussing, you know, his background and, and the activities he's involved with, and, and we're walking shoulder to shoulder, and he stopped, and I 
I kept going. I had to turn around and look back at him and say, you know, what, you okay? And he goes, and he was staring at the memorial and he said, I had no idea it was this size and this scope and this, um, of this magnitude. We had no experience building memorials. We didn't know that we had built something that in his words he described as, um, you only see these, this size and the scope of a memorial um, in our nation's capital or on major military installations. And he was just flabbergasted that a little small community had come up with such a, a grand memorial. Um, and it goes back to a tribute to the people in, in the community and, and the creative genius and, and the synergy of the committee that, that brought it all together and the fundraising. And like I said, we raised $100,000 in seven months of non-government private sector money is all donations. And if you go to the website, you can still see all the donors that are involved. There's hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. There was a, a small child that was added mm -hmm. uh, after the event. Tell us how that came about and was this, were the same people involved uh, as far as the artwork? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly. We knew that we wanted to add something else to, to the original. And, um, and because of, we had a little bit of money left over, we decided that uh, it would be good to add a child. And the next generation, right? Right, the next generation. And um, who was it that was, who was the military guy? It's, was it's a family friend of Bill and Janet Norwood's, Norwood's family. Yeah. And they were, they'd come into town and he's, and I wish I could remember their name, but he is a captain in the army. And he has a little son, the son's actually in junior high now, but at the time he brought his family up there and they were explaining the background of the Section. memorial and how it happened. and and all of the um, work that had gone into it and the people that had volunteered. So the adults are over on one side of the memorial looking at it and the, the little boy walked over there and he just saluted. And um, one of the Norwoods took a picture of it and just happened to catch the, the, that instance and it was such a cute photo and, and pretty touching too that um, the photo just went viral in our little community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when Kathy Ella said, that's our new statue. Mm -hmm. And so y'all kept, y'all well, did a good I, job I, of capturing the little boy. I mean, it, you can definitely tell it's that, that, that little boy. That little boy. Uh, I came up with a couple of different things. Uh, one was a little girl with a flag, but she was going to be on the other side of the sidewalk and she was going to be raising the, you know, waving the flag. And, but then when we came up with this photo of the little boy and him saluting, it was just perfect and uh, couldn't ask for anything better. The community has uh, embraced this uh, landmark. Uh, in fact, uh, it has now evolved to a, uh, an annual Veterans Day mm -hmm. community celebration um, that is well attended, has the flyover, um, mm -hmm. and so many student groups are involved, mm -hmm. which means that the torch is being passed, the, the patriotism, the service, the commitment, the et cetera. So you wanna talk about uh, one of those celebrations, what it's like? Well, it, it's um, a Veterans Day celebration mm -hmm. where we celebrate all veterans, and, you know, living and, and deceased. And um, Fleurville is a very patriotic community. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it gets, we get a lot of involvement and activity from the schools, the student bands, um, a lot of uh, vets show up for it. Uh, it it's, just, it's just something the community obviously needed because the community responded and participates. And we'll have two or three hundred people at each one of them. And it started out smaller than that and it just grows every year as people hear about the Veterans Day. And they'll take their kids out of school, well no, school's out. They'll bring their kids up there. And, mm -hmm. and I really think it's important that the, the youth understand that there were people that were you know, born in, in the early 1900s that went off and died 
defending Fleurville's freedom. And we, during the whole course of the mem building the memorial, we talked about preserving our freedom. And kind of the, the, the theme of the memorial was that we'll never forget our, our family and friends and classmates who died preserving Pflugerville's freedom. And I think that the, the attraction to the memorial or to the, to the uh, Veterans Day ceremonies is that we don't want to forget. And, and these young people need to know that freedom isn't free, as President Reagan said. It's also a time that uh, uh, some of the national dignitaries, our congressmen, mm -hmm. uh, do make uh, a point to come mm -hmm. and visit locally. Yes, they do. It's one of the largest uh, memorials in the Central Texas area. And I know we worked with Cedar Park's mm -hmm. committee to build a memorial, and they actually built a large park with a, a memorial as one of the features in it. And um, ours was so successful that they came to us, they approached us and said, would you help us design ours? And we said, we really don't want to help design it. I mean, it has to be a, a local effort. But they wanted to know how we did it. Mm -hmm. and. There's also, you've also worked with a man in Louisiana. Yes, that, uh, Morgan called, City. Morgan City. Louisiana. Uh, he actually is a soldier. He was, uh, his family's here, but he lives in, in Morgan City. And he decided he wanted something very similar to that, to what we have in his hometown. So I designed one for them. It's very similar to the one we have here, but the, uh, the, World War II fellow or Vietnam era fellow is kneeling to hand the flag to the child. So it's a little different. I remember we had a conversation. Um, I first met him, I think it was in First Texas Bank at Jan in Janice Heath's office. And uh, he wanted to know, he was worried about funding it. Mm -hmm. uh, how how do you raise great. money to do this? And he was talking to the city council in Morgan City, and they were considering funding some type of memorial. <clears throat> and I told him, I said, do not deny your neighbors the opportunity to contribute to it. If you have government just come in and write a check for it, you will deny them the opportunity to participate, and it won't have the same meaning in your community. And he was pretty shocked that we had not used any government money to do this. It was all private donations. And so I don't know how he ended up raising all his money. We haven't been in touch in a year or so, but uh, I strongly encouraged him not to deny his neighbors a chance to be a part of it. And they did, and the neighbors in Pflugerville are the ones who built it. Uh, another thing I think they're doing now with the veterans on that special occasion is uh, someone is providing them a, a light meal following the, uh, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. ceremony. Yes. That they can gather and Talk mm -hmm. to one another mm -hmm. more intimately. And you get a bunch of vets together and they're going to start oh, telling they stories. Stole, they tell stories. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> the amazing thing, too, was after Byron's uh, being a casualty, Pflugerville then, for the size town it was then, much smaller, we had three subsequent uh, funerals yes. of, of military during that uh, effort. One of the sad stories about it, I mean, other than everybody losing a loved one, but Janet Norwood was friends with Yari's mother. Mm -hmm. And she was actually at the house when the military showed up to oh, tell his mother God. that he'd been killed. And Janet said God put her in that position at that particular time, just happened to be over there visiting with her. And so she had to go through that grieving process again, which I thought was pretty rough. But the Norwoods are they're strong people. They're, they're some of the strongest people I've ever met. Um, and when the Norwoods actually went to uh, Washington, D.C. for the State of the Union with George W. Bush mm -hmm. to sit with uh, the lady. <laughs> we were looking for the Norwoods. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the group we put together decided that because Byron's death was so recent and fresh in our memories, <clears throat> that it would just be polite to tell them about our plans, what we were going to do, mm -hmm. and, and to let them know that his death was a catalyst that caused this idea to build a memorial. We couldn't find him. And there was a man at church that said, I know him, I'll get in touch with him. And they weren't responding and weren't responding, and I thought maybe they weren't interested. 
And then I watched the State of the Union address and I went, oh, now I know why they're not calling me back. They're <laughs> gifts to the president and Laura Bush. And um, um, Janet, in the midst of all that emotion in the State of the Union where President Bush specifically mentioned Byron, <clears throat> there was a, um, an Iraqi woman whose father had been killed by Saddam Hussein. And she was, she was seated in the tier of seats immediately in front of Janet, but lower. And for some reason, she and Janet decided to hug each other, and they got all their jewelry all tangled up on national TV, <laughs> and then they got the giggling. And so people thought it was unusual. I'm sure the national reaction was like, here are these two women who are grieving for the loss of a loved one, they're just giggling like schoolgirls, but they were trying to get unhooked from each other. <laughs> And, and I know that uh, the first lady started giggling too, and, and, and sure. I, the president was looking up at, in the stands like, what, what are they on doing? What the earth is going so. on? Uh, and I think in that same period of time, then the uh, local Pflugerville U.S. Post Office was renamed mm -hmm. with uh, a plaque with Byron. Byron. Right. It's Byron. now the Byron Norwood. Our congressman was. Um, mm -hmm. Was, introduced that bill and it flew through the House. Michael McCall. Michael McCall. Mm -hmm. And it flew through the House and the Senate, you know, rubber stamped it and said, of course. Um, there's a lot of funny stories in, that came out of this tragedy. And one of them is after the State of the Union, and these are conveyed to me by the Norwoods. After the State of the Union address, um, the Norwoods were ushered into a private anteroom where President Bush was going to return from the speech and kind of decompress. And you know, the motions were running high and uh, everybody was crying in this room and the President came into the room and he immediately went over to Janet and gave her a big hug. And she said, Mr. President, you made my makeup run. <laughs> and he said, that's okay. You made my makeup run too. <laughs> so, you know, they were both wiping their, their, their whatever the makeup is. Makeup. That, you know. Yeah. And uh, she said, he's just a, she really enjoyed meeting the president and his support. So when the bill came, when Congressman McCall introduced the bill, the president signed off on it immediately. Uh, there was another uh, post Byron, uh, I think it was the Lyerly, perhaps, funeral that mm -hmm. was at St. Elizabeth's Church and uh, the, Park Crest Middle School line, the Railroad Avenue with their little flags mm -hmm. and salute uh, they all did. the way. It was just very, uh, very touching. Mm -hmm. That was one of, uh, uh, Lyra Lee was one of the few warriors we lost in combat who had children. Mm -hmm. He may be the only one, mm -hmm. but it's real unusual. Most of the warriors are young mm -hmm. and they're, um, you know, they don't have families yet. Not married. And, um, but uh, Captain Lyerly, he was, he was a rarity. And the really interesting thing about that too is Captain Lyerly is an Aggie. And his wife really, she didn't go to A&M, I think she went to school in Florida, and she didn't grasp the concept of the Aggie culture. <laughs> and the, um, Upon his classmates at A&M learning he had been killed, they just automatically started gravitating towards Pflugerville. And they knew where he lived and they, people were just showing up at her house. And here you've got a, a young widow grieving and she's been overwhelmed by all these strangers coming to the house and said, we're Aggies, you know, we knew your husband. And um, um, in the midst of being overwhelmed, and she didn't know how to entertain these people, what, what, how, to, you know, how to host them or anything else. One of the Aggies said, we need to call the Aggie Moms. Okay. So they contacted the Round Rock Aggie Moms Club and you don't call them in unless you, you're really ready for serious. them. really serious. They <laughs> show up in droves. And I don't know, my wife is an Aggie mom and she got a phone call, so we need this, this, and this, and this. What are you gonna do? Which one of these can you do and when can you get it there? And the president, I guess is a president of the Aggie Moms Club, I try to stay away from that group because they're formidable. <laughs> but um, she took charge and in, in a matter of a couple of hours they had transportation to and from the airport organized. They had hotel deals cut for the people coming in. They had food showing up. They were, um, the Aggie moms just came in and just took over the Lyerly household. And 
it was reported back to me that this young widow, she said, I finally get it, I understand. And it, it was kind of touching that, you know, they were there for her like that, but there's just a whole lot of personal stories about the, um, about the fallen. And like I said, out of tragedy comes some humor sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is again a profound story of the volunteerism and the spirit of this community. Mm -hmm. It's very strong. Very. Um, I think it was in the past year or so that we had a big flood that came through Pflugerville and the creek got up. Did it get close to the wire mm -hmm. memorial? Mm -hmm. It yes. had to. Yeah. Yes. I heard that they spent three days cleaning the, the debris. the damage was not significant. No, but they were able to clean it all. But it came all the way up to the top of the helmet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Y'all didn't they tell had, me that. <laughs> that they had to uh, clean the debris away from that area up that high on the, on the sculpture. I guess we anchored all that pretty well. Then, yeah, we did. Yeah. I think so. And it's just stay there. Mike, we're going to go on to uh, your service on the city council. Uh, you served how many years? One term, three years. Okay. And so what were the challenges facing the city at that time during your service? I served from 2008 to 2011, and those weren't the best economic times. And the city was, the city just didn't have a lot of tax dollars. So the biggest challenge was just to keep the city running. And we were looking for nickels and pennies, and um, we had a um, very, very tight budget. So we were trying to allocate very scarce resources to do the best we could. And we knew there's an economic boom going to come to us eventually because of 130. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Tollway 130. Um, but it hadn't hit here yet. And we were just doing our best to keep the city running. And um, we, during my term, we had two different city managers, and both of them were very, very good at, at stretching that penny to keep it running. Uh, at the same time, we were trying to lower the tax rate. We had the highest tax rate in Central Texas, property tax rate. We had very little sales tax revenue coming in. So we wanted to lower the burden on the households, on the, on the residential property at the same time, try to keep the city services running. And there was a lot of creative um, sessions where the council said, all right, we'll, we'll postpone this, but we need to execute on this. Um, one of the things we came up with was a recycling program. And working with the uh, vendor, ISI, who was our uh, solid waste collection contractor, they put together a recycling program that became another model that other cities study right now. And Pflugerville embraced this recycling program and it just excelled at it. It, it passed all expectations in the industry by IAS's expectations and by the city's expectations. So we started recycling, but one of the, one of the ways it was actually came out of a budget need because we weren't able to pay to overlay the roads and maintain the, the asphalt surfaces. So what we did was to relieve the point loads. Every garbage collection truck that rolls down is the equivalent of several thousand cars. Mm. And so by going to recycling, we reduced the number of garbage trucks on the streets and we reduced the frequency of service because we could recycle now. And those are the kind of creative programs we came up with to help the city save money during those times. So it was, um, it was, there were a lot of good ideas coming about. Our, our city council that I served with and the successive city councils that I've stayed in touch with, um, they're very, very budget conscious and they're very, very fiscally conservative, which has served our city well. It got us through some tight times. Uh, by trade, you are a uh, developer or builder? Home builder, Home yes. builder. Uh, so tell us about, uh, lot size, our building in the city of Pflugerville, and uh, what you've seen change over your uh, career here. The city has addressed the development in a, um, in a very proactive manner because we knew we were going to grow dramatically. 
originally the lot size was 9,000 square foot minimum. And now we've gotten different, uh, different sections of, and different methods to develop in the Unified Development Code that um, allows us to do smaller lots, but they have to have a certain characteristics to them to qualify for the smaller lots, like more urban uh, densities, um, planned unit development, condo regimes. So it, it's, it's natural that a city modify the, de the regulations governing development, but we've always had a very dedicated city staff in the planning department, and they've always looked forward, um, been forward thinking, and they've gotten us prepared to develop into, uh, to handle all this growth in a very qualified and a very classy manner. We're, we're going to evolve into a large city that will be very well thought out. It's going to be, it's going to continue to be a good place to live. One of the um, proactive things uh, the city also did was to extend its ETJ to the east. That's where the city has that area mm -hmm. to grow, mm -hmm. which is pretty much a blank sheet of paper that mm -hmm. the city can create a model design. Right. Um, how do you see um, SH-130 coming through and the change in the business, et cetera? What, what, what is your vision for the next, uh, say, two, five, or 10 years? 130 was a catalyst for Pflugerville to grow. We had always been a very quiet, unassuming bedroom community of Austin. And then as Round Rock grew, we became kind of sandwiched between the two larger cities. When 130 came through, I call it our concrete river because historically growth and development has always followed means of transportation. Originally it was river banks and then it was the railroads and we lost our railroad tracks in I think the late 60s. And um, we, 35 off to our west was not part of Pflugerville. Uh, Austin annexed all of that and was not interested in cooperating with Pflugerville and giving us some, some highway frontage. So when 130 came through, it was, it was our concrete river that caused development to follow that mode of transportation. We will have, in the next couple of years, with the latest project that's come here, um, some eight and nine story office buildings, we will, which is unheard of in Pflugerville. And we'll have um, a tremendous amount of retail and a tremendous amount of um, commercial growth. Already, with the development of Stonehill, which is, Stonehill may be seven or eight years, it was, it was prior to me coming on council when that agreement, development agreement was cut with the developers of Stonehill, that um, with Stonehill maturing and with the other retail, the Downtown Business Association, and um, some of the businesses they promoted and supported down there, for the first time in Pflugerville's history, the sales tax revenue is exceeding the property tax revenue, which allowed the city council this past year to drop the sales, the property rates uh, about five cents, which is just incredible in municipal government. So Pflugerville is going to evolve into a very well planned out, thought, well thought out community, and it's gonna be as affordable as it's always been. And, and Pflugerville, is, they have, Pflugerville has one of the highest per capita education, educated populations in Central Texas. They also have one of the highest household incomes in Central Texas. And this information is old and it may have changed a little bit, but at one time, the household income in Pflugerville was second only to the household income in the Eaton School District. The difference was we had two working members in the Fleurville household and the Eames district had one, but we were neck and neck as to disposable income. So this growth and this development is attracted to Fleurville because we've got the green field, we have the water with the Lake Fleurville, we have a major electrical transmission uh, system just to the east of town. We've got a very forward thinking planning department who is who advocates for growth and, ad and tries to work with developers. And 
all of that development and all that business is attracted to Fleurieville because of the highly educated population and the disposable income in Fleurieville. So all of the pieces are coming together and the synergy they're creating is greater than the sum of the whole and we will see explosive growth in Fleurieville. Um, all of that work uh, has also come to fruition in that the city has been recognized nationally, I think, in several magazines as a, a quality of life place or a destination place. Mm -hmm. And the editors of the magazines can't pronounce the name of the town. They're going, where did this little town <laughs> come from? It just sprang up out of nowhere. But I don't think that they understand the character of the people in Fleurville either. On the fun side, uh, the PF in Fleurville has uh, become a brand. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the Firecracker, uh, July mm -hmm. 4th event. Mm -hmm. We have now fun and the family feeling, etc. cetera. So, uh, Brittany, you've been a volunteer also, I know, with the Chamber. And they come up with these unique slogans. And you've served on the, uh, on, on the board or been very active. Tell us a little bit about the Chamber and, and its efforts. Well, the Chamber has always uh, put Fleurville, you know, first and foremost as far as putting it out to the people and putting it out to um, the community and getting, it, getting businesses to come in and join so that we have um, a diverse type of, of um, board and, uh, and they, they offer um, different ideas and um, very engaging um, events from time to time. And um, so I think that keeps the interest really high and keeps uh, people thinking about Pflugerville and of course the, the name, the more you can get it out there and, um, and the more people learn how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go back uh, in time a little bit on why you, what attracted you to move to Pflugerville and then what were your first impressions of the town? I grew up in a small town and uh, we, Jill and I got married and moved to Austin, lived in an apartment there and we started looking for a house to buy. I took a map out of the city of Austin and I outlined the city boundaries, the city limits of Austin and, she, and Jill said, so we're going to look for a house anywhere inside the circle and I said, no, we're going to look for a house anywhere outside the outside. circle. <laughs> <laughs> and so we came north and found a, a cute little home in Gatlinburg, which is the first real subdivision mm -hmm. on a large scale in, in Fleurville. And we bought the house and that's how we came here. We knew it had a good school district. We knew that uh, it was a smaller town. And um, we really didn't get involved in, in the, we didn't get out into the community and start meeting everybody until <coughs> our son started playing soccer. And that's a, a oft-repeated story that the, the children drag you into the community mm -hmm. and you get involved in the community and then we started meeting people and um, found out their opportunities to volunteer in government and, um, and and support the town so that's basically how we we came here it was anywhere but Austin <laughs> and that's another uh, keen example of volunteerism because it's through the children that parents volunteer to coach and to support sports leagues and our events and uh, I, I think that's I, I was a volunteer coach for the under six soccer leagues I never played <laughs> soccer I actually had a rule book with me on the sidelines trying to find out <laughs> and, and one of the one of the people who knew a lot about soccer is Carrie Betts and we got to know Carrie and Jennifer Betts real well and Carrie would help me with this with the soccer. Of course, at that age, it's not sophisticated. Mm -hmm. You line all the boys up and you say, we're going that way. <laughs> and periodically, you'd have to remind them. We're going to take the ball that way. Periodically, you have to remind them of it. But um, that was our first real volunteer job is to be a soccer coach. And Britta, how did you decide to come to Fliggerville? What, what was your attraction? Well, my husband built his business here in uh, 1986. And, um, and we also started going to church here in Pflugerville at Emmanuel. And um, it just seemed like the perfect fit for us. Um, I was in a, a, 
a small gallery downtown Austin, 51st Street and Burnett Road, and with uh, six other ladies sharing a space. And uh, when the 301 West Pecan became available, it was like, that's mine, I want it. <laughs> So, but what's the history of your little uh, place, uh, the, the, well, the building it, itself? Well, the building itself it was actually, I think, born in the, uh, uh, was built in the 60s, early 60s. Uh, it was a house. It was actually a two-bedroom house when we bought it. The flag had been in there. The Flickerill flag had been a, a business in there. Um, it was the first parks and rec building, and uh, the fellow that was um, hired to be the Parks and Rec director actually was the one that planted all of the crepe myrtles along the side of the street. Is that Glenn and, Holzer? Yes, that was Glenn Holzer. And um, then we bought it after the flag moved out and uh, converted it to what it is today. So, and I've been there 16 years. Well, it'll be 17 years this year. And it's uh, one of those things that uh, was a gateway to the city. Now, there was a group of volunteers who also adopted to uh, do something on our gateway and our Christmas decorations. Do either of you have any information on that group? Yes. <clears throat> no. Uh, David Seeker, oh. when he was on the city council, wanted to That's true. Um, build some kind of entrance to the city. And so he reached out to the Keep Pflugerville Beautiful group uh, who my wife was a member of that group and it, so it was um, it, it was quite a strong willed group of women and David told me later that he said I think I bit off more than I can chew with these women because they came <laughs> in and took charge and <clears throat> I think they wanted to spend a hundred thousand dollars on it and that was just impossible to come up with in the city of Pflugerville so they had to lower their, their vision a little bit, to reduce their vision to something that was more affordable, but they built the, um, on the city land where the water storage tank is out on mm -hmm. 1825, they went in there and planted some bushes and put some, a sign, had a sign made and some lighting and things like that, and that was the first gateway. But it was, um, it was a volunteer group to keep Pflugerville beautiful as part of the Keep America Beautiful program. Uh, there's a lot of uh, events that go on in our town. One is the uh, annual Deutschenfest, mm -hmm. uh, spelled with a PF. And then uh, we recently have a Chili Fest, I think, that mm -hmm. is becoming very noted. So can you talk about uh, being involved in either of those events? With a PF as well, the Chili Fest. Yeah. Um, it started out as a, as a uh, PDA, which is Downtown Association event. And uh, we had actually two of them at the time, uh, the, the Christmas Stroll and the Chili Fest. And then um, all of a sudden, about five years ago, the city decided that they wanted to take those over and, uh, you know, from, from the Downtown Association, which at the time we were having, you know, some volunteers that were kind of dropping off and not doing as much. So uh, the city did take that over and uh, made a, a great event out of it and has, been, has ever since. It's, a, it's a great for people to get out and come down to downtown Pflugerville and, and taste chili and drink beer and, and have a good time and there's entertainment and, um, and now the city, I think the city wants the uh, Pflugerville Downtown Association to kind of take it back. It's and, gotten bigger. <laughs> and, so, well, there's been uh, over the decades uh, a challenge to attract uh, customers, uh, visitors to downtown Pflugerville. It's always what can we do to make it better, and uh, um, I, I know Absolutely. that uh, I don't know how many members you have now, but um, you're always looking for new things to do in that category. We are, and. Um, and it has it 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 has it's it's kind of like a, a, a tide, you know. It comes in and, and they go out, and it, so it kind of comes and wanes. But um, 
we're always looking for new members to come in and give us new ideas about what we can do to bring people downtown. And um, I think there's a couple of things that we do do. The um, Spring Fest that we have like the weekend before Mother's Day or of Mother's Day is a fun time for people to come downtown just to see what's down here. We bring in vendors from all over and uh, with their arts and crafts and then also the one in December and of course the Chili Fest. And um, so these are just ways to bring the community back into downtown, let them know what's here, give them a sense of, of um, what their community is, is about and what, we're, what we'd love to have them be a part of. Uh, there's also Fluger Golf, I think, that yes. you do. And, uh, there is. Uh, one of the neat things about that is the uh, you, you recognize a legend every year, which really is uh, a neat way to recognize volunteers or key characters in the town. Absolutely, we've had some of the, the greatest key characters that we can uh, that, that have been key to the to the city itself uh, back before it ever became a city, even. Um, I'm going to give you this opportunity to uh, talk about any uh, key business owners or citizens or leaders, game changers that uh, you may think of uh, over the decades that you've lived here. One of the unique things about Pflugerville is there's never been one prominent leader in the community. There have been many mm -hmm. people who've contributed with, with their, their specific talents. There's been, um, you know, over the, over the history of the city, there's been different needs at different times and different leaders have stepped up. And I visit with a lot of the, the older generation in Pflugerville at the Lions Club and at um, at church and I always hear a new story about well I remember when we all had to get together and mow the right away or we had to get together and uh, well I was complaining about being on city council at the Lions Club one night <clears throat> and Robert Weiss asked me how how I was doing on the council and I said you know I whined and belly ached and complained a little bit and he said yeah it was tough when I was on city council too we had to go repair potholes after the meetings so I decided to shut up and not complain anymore because they weren't making me repair potholes. But um, there's, it's always been a, a collaborative group effort. And there, there's not, I was asked by one time by the press, who would you say was the single most important person in town? And I couldn't answer the question. I said there's not a single most important. There's a whole lot of people who've done a whole lot to keep this community running. Um, and and to, to guide it through its evolution, and you don't see that. There's no, there's not anybody who wants to take credit for it. There's not anybody who wants to stand out in the limelight, and I, I think that speaks to the heart of the community that they do what they have to do. It's probably back to their old pioneer heritage days. Mm -hmm. You came in and you did what you needed to do to make the city function, and, and to improve the city. I, uh, I think you're very on target there. In 2007, when Pflugerville went to the state finals football game, played in the Alamo Dome, on that pathway they played Abilene High School, which was a, a prominent football power. The Abilene newspaper called me and asked, who was your most famous graduate, or name some of your key graduates from PHS? And my response was exactly what you said. All of our graduates do well mm -hmm. in different categories, different arenas. Mm -hmm. I think that's very true. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Pflugerville also made an effort uh, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 to have a community effort. It was called Pflugerville Remembers 9-11. Mm -hmm. And Britta, you want to share some of the uh, components of that event? Well, Gene and Dave Garlick were the ones that actually uh, instigated that. They brought us all together, and um, because, I guess because I've been on the memorial uh, committee before, I was part of that. Um, 
we just basically tried to get as many people involved, as many of the schools involved, and tried to make it um, a, a memory for uh, the citizens of Pflugerville um, to uh, commemorate that, that day. You know, there's, I was at the football game. We canceled the football games the Friday following the attack on the World Trade Centers and the 9-11 incident. And the next Friday, we played at home, and I was sitting in the stands, and um, you know the parents all get together and the neighbors, and it's a big social event at a small town football game. Mm -hmm. And I remember Bill Russey, and he was just kind of in shock, and I said, you know, Bill, you all right? And he goes, my boy and a bunch of his friends all went down and enlisted. He said, and then the word, you know, people started listening on the conversation and somebody said, yeah, my neighbor's son went down and enlisted. And this, and it was almost like a World War II kind of event where all these young boys were just so upset and they were so ticked off and they went down and, and signed up for the military. And it was kind of an old fashioned kind of a recruiting effort. I don't think there's an effort made to recruit the Pflugerville High School seniors. They just got it in their head and they all went down and joined the military. And, you know, a lot of the parents were talking about, you know, they really wished their sons didn't have to go serve, but there was no stopping them. These boys were headstrong. They were heading down. And, and nowadays, there were some daughters that were involved too. Mm -hmm. But, um, You know, when we had the 911 ceremony, it was kind of, it was a month or so afterwards, or how, when, I forget when it was, but it was, um, it was, it just indicated the patriotism of the community as exhibited by the kids. Well, it was held at the stadium, and I think it was yeah. practically filled. It was. It was. Uh, mm -hmm. There were uh, thousands all of people of the there. the service uh, groups were there, and the fire department, right. and the police department, and the EMS, everybody was uh, a part of and that. the kids showed right. up. That's right. what surprised me. I don't. Absolutely. Sometimes you wonder if they understood the magnitude of what had happened, but mm -hmm. whether no. they did or not, they were there. They were there. Yeah, and th and they weren't coming just with their parents. There, there were groups of kids showing up in their own cars and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about the patriotism too, I remember my daughter was uh, in Afghanistan uh, after that event, and uh, when I would go to the Panther football games, the the team started carrying a U.S. flag as they came through the tunnel onto the field mm -hmm. uh, prior to the game and then, of course, right after halftime. And that was um, very symbolic, very significant. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion about the youth in Pflugerville and the way they responded to 9-11 and the patriotism they displayed. And then w later on we got involved in the memorial and uh, I made the comment to somebody that I remembered, you know, my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation be called the greatest generation because of what they went through in World War mm -hmm. II. And I said, I'm not sure, but I think we're forming the next great generation. It wasn't my generation. You know, we were the Vietnam era people mm -hmm. and, and the Korean era. And uh, I, I think that the youth in Pflugerville, their, their grandparents and their great-grandparents, they're going to duplicate their effort in the world. I mean, I, it, these are impressive kids we've got in this town. And, I, you know, that's to some credit to the parents, but they're also just a synergy in the, the, uh, the involvement that they create among themselves, and they push each other to, to be patriotic and, mm -hmm. and proud. Uh one other volunteer effort, I know that you're involved in the Lions Club, Mike, and I know they do a lot of uh, helpful things to groups and families in the community, and one even with the city, which is the Blue Santa. You want to mm -hmm. talk about uh, the Lions Club? The Pflugerville Lions Club is one of the predominant Lions Club in Texas. Uh, we are, I don't know how they, I think they rate it like a five-star club because we give 900% of the requirements back to the Lions International Organization. And we're big supporters of the, um, the local community also. That's our primary focus. And we support families in need. We support um, people who've 
who suffered financial tragedy through medical issues. Um, we support all the nurses uh, in the Pflugerville High School. Uh, and when I say support, we, we give them an annual stipend to help them with some of the expenses that uh, the school district doesn't cover and, and it's not really appropriate for the school district to cover. And um, we, we have the Blue Santa Christmas party every year and the cost of admission is a toy. You have to bring something. Um, the Lions Club was the first group that wrote a $5,000 check to the Fallen Warrior Memorial. And that's how I got involved with them. I said, you know, this, this group is the kind of group that I need to be associated with. So that's why I became a member. Um, it is a group of grumpy old men with hearts as big as that building. And you walk in there and you would think, these are tough old goats. And all you got to do is say, there's a kid that needs some help. They are all over it. And they, they not only put their efforts behind it, but they, uh, they put a lot of financial support behind it too. But don't tell, don't tell anybody that they're not, they're big hearted people. They'll, they'll chew you out for it. <laughs> they'll be after you. Yeah, they will. <laughs> Any final statements you would like to make as to um, the celebration of the city uh, or where it's going or to the citizens who are here today? We're just happy that it's been this long and that it's going to continue to be that much longer and that much farther ahead. We're, we're going to grow explosively in the next decade. And it's going to be very important that each individual who calls Pflugerville home contributes to keeping that small town attitude and that small town atmosphere. We can't become strangers to each other. Mm -hmm. Even though there's going to be tax dollars to take care of a lot of projects and do a lot of things, we still need that volunteerism that's caused Pflugerville to get to this point. And that volunteerism will result in that small town atmosphere that served us so well. And that's going to be a big chore so that we still get out and be soccer coaches and we still get out and join the Lions Club and we participate in the Pflugerville Downtown Association. You don't have to be a business downtown to participate in it. You can, they have individual memberships that you still find some way to get involved in the community. And it's only through that volunteerism that we're gonna be able to keep that small town attitude. And everybody worries about losing it. And it's very clear to me how you keep it. You, you volunteer to go serve on the council and you patch the potholes. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's those emerging leaders, those visionaries who have ideas that may be off the chart, but they might be reined in, but eventually you have that togetherness feeling, the collaboration, and uh, something right. good happens. Yeah, they, they're, they're somewhere out there, there's a the beginning of a new hike and bike trail type project, and it just takes some volunteer to say, I think we ought to go down this direction. And you may get, the idea may get poo-pooed a little bit, but you know, it'll stick. If it's a good idea, it'll stick, and it'll take mm -hmm. legs and start growing. And it's not hard, all you gotta do is say, I need some help, and somebody will come up and help you. You know, the city's planted a lot of trees, too, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Are they known mm -hmm. as an arbor city? Or yes. Yes, so? we, are, we are a U.S. forest city. Well, uh, thank you for being key characters and for uh, leaving your footprints. Characters. And I know they will continue <laughs> to get bigger because of your, uh, your, your knowledge and energy and, and vision. Thank you very much.